Final item of business is members' business debate on motion 11737 in the name of Joan McAlpine on appropriate housing for people with learning disabilities. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Joan McAlpine to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much. The ache for home lives in all of us. The safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. Those words by Maya Angelou are particularly appropriate for today's debate. Four walls and a roof make a house, but it's a home that many people with learning disabilities ache for. I'm grateful to the cross-party group on learning disability to, who asked for this motion and whose members shared some of their experiences and opinions on this subject. And I also thank Enable Scotland for their briefing today. Last year, the Scottish Government uh, commissioned the wide-ranging report Improving Outcomes for People with Learning Disabilities, Opportunities and Challenges for Housing. It was undertaken by the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability. The report offers very clear routes forward and the purpose of today is to ensure that those routes are followed. First, let's talk about progress. Fewer people are now forced to live in hospitals or institutional care when they have no clinical need to be there. Fewer, but not all. There are examples of excellent practice, stories of lives transformed by having an appropriate home. The movement out of institutions into the community in the last 20 years is a mark of our society's progress towards equality and inclusivity. But good practice, the report found, varies significantly between local authorities. Overall, the report found a lack of suitable homes for people with learning disabilities, and there's also a lack of clear guidance for people with learning disabilities looking for a home. Restrictions to housing and disability benefits by the UK government is making things much worse. In some places, too many individuals still live in inappropriate residential care, and there were reports of local authorities suggesting people currently living independently move into a care home for cost reasons, which I think we can all agree is completely unacceptable. And last year, 698 households who were homeless or threatened with homelessness had learning disability recorded as a support need. The overall direction of travel, as I said, is positive. In 1998, only 600 people with a learning disability lived in supported accommodation. That figure rose to 4,622 in 2015, and more people, again, live in mainstream housing with support. But 23,186 adults with a learning disability are known to local authorities across Scotland. Some don't require or want housing support, but others do, and we need a better understanding of need. One in three adults with a learning disability live with their parents or family carers, and if that is their choice, that's good. However, families understand the need to future plan for a time when parents can no longer care, and often the options they are offered, if they're offered them at all, are unsuitable. There's a wide spectrum of need amongst people with learning disabilities. Some individuals require 24-hour care, others far less, but most will require adapted accommodation. We know from the government's groundbreaking Keys to Life research that people with a learning disability are more likely to suffer from physical ill health, and the report recommends that ground floor accommodation is offered. People First, an organisation led by those with learning disability, have told us they often want to live close to their family and friends. Social isolation and bullying can be a serious problem for people with learning disabilities, but they are offer, often offered accommodation by local authorities, where there's a high crime rate, for example, leaving them vulnerable. James McNabb of People First told the cross-party group that housing application forms are often too complicated, so support completing them should be offered. Mr McNabb also said that people with learning disabilities and shared tenancies often had little say in who their flatmates were, and that lack of choice was also highlighted in the Commission's report. The report found a growth in what is called a core and cluster model of supported housing, that is, people living in their own homes around a hub of support, usually with some communal space. I know from personal experience that this model can be very successful. It provides independence while also tackling social isolation. 
Providing developments remain small with high quality person-centred person support packages. Any concerns that this model risks being institutional are, in my view, unfounded. But it shouldn't be forced on tenants who are currently happy living in their own tenancy with, with support. The SCLD report recommended starting a national conversation on how to achieve better housing outcomes for people with a learning disability. And I hope that this debate contributes to that conversation. The report also recommended ways to improve data, particularly at a local level, and that's a real big challenge that we need to address. It asked government to develop an implementation framework to prevent people with learning disabilities being accommodated in healthcare settings unnecessarily. It wants more specific guidance to ensure that local housing strategies more effectively address the needs of people with learning disability. And it also asks for greater consideration of the keys to life outcomes within strategic planning and commissioning processes. On a pleasingly practical level, it, it calls for joint protocols between local authorities and other registered social landlords, again to achieve positive housing outcomes for people with learning disabilities. That these recommendations come from a government commission report is a great start. And so too is the housing minister's letter to the cross-party group in which he says his officials are working to strengthen links between the housing sector and organisations representing people with learning disabilities, their families and carers. Uh, we must monitor that. I welcome um, Mr Stewart's instruction that councils' local housing strategies must set out their priorities and plans for meeting the needs with people with a learning disability. And the Scottish Government's guidance to councils on local housing strategies is un under review, I understand, and that offers a tremendous opportunity uh, to put the recommendations of the report into practice. Sometimes local authorities need very clear direction to ensure that the priorities set by government and endorsed by this parliament are adhered to. I look forward to hearing more from the Minister on these plans to ensure that people with learning disabilities no longer ache for a place to call home. Thank you. We move to the open debate. Speeches of four minutes, please. Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer, and can I uh, thank Joe McIpham for securing um, this debate on this um, important subject. Um, I think things have moved on um, pleasingly well uh, here in Scotland since the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, when too many people were still left in hospitals or institutions which were totally unsuitable and didn't meet their needs of them or their family. I think there's still perhaps, uh, even within my mindset, and I was talking to some friends last night, that those with learning difficulties do still need um, either family, to live with family or to live with care. And it was, I was interested to note that 65% of those who have um, some form of learning difficulty actually do live alone in appropriate housing. And I think that is something we can be proud of and something that gives people the choice that we have. In the uh, short time that I have, can I just make a couple of points? I think picking up from the previous speaker, I think there is concern from those that I have spoken to that there is different practices within different local authorities across Scotland. And I, um, after yesterday's debate, I'm not for centralisation, but I do think we must make sure that this is not post-code led and that the service you get in one local authority is the service you get in another. And I think there is a role for uh, Scottish Government to at least encourage and to monitor and to push local authorities forward to make sure that uh, the policies that you have in one part of Scotland, you have in another. The second area, and I don't want to uh, go back to where we were yesterday afternoon, but I would again push uh, the Minister in regard to having the appropriate housing built for those with disabilities. That those with learning difficulties will have adaptations that they will require in some circumstances that will be different from, if you like, mainstream housing. And I think it is often expensive, uh, both for the local authority or housing association, to make those alterations at a later stage. 
and I do think we should. Kevin Stewart. Appreciate, appreciate Mr. Balfour giving way there, um, uh, President Officer. Um, this is something maybe that all of us uh, can put across to local authorities. I've said it before in this chamber, and I'll reiterate it here again. Uh, in terms of their needs and demands for housing, uh, while I won't open up the can of worms that is subsidy a as a whole, I've said, and I'll make it quite clear again, that if, they, if councils talk to my officials on the ground, there will be additional subsidy uh, for this kind of housing, for folk with learning disabilities, uh, with physical disabilities, uh, as long uh, as they have those discussions with officials. And I hope that every member in the chamber uh, will uh, reiterate that to their local authorities uh, uh, when it comes to discussing these matters. Jeremy Balfour. I, I am very grateful uh, for the Minister uh, for that intervention um, and those remarks. Um, I do still think with the planning bill at the stage that it is, it's something that at stage two and at stage three, we can perhaps look at as a parliament. Very briefly, uh, presiding officer, um, I do think, um, although it is great that many people um, who have a disability can live alone, there is a danger of loneliness. And we cannot simply look at housing in, uh, by itself without looking at other issues. Again, particularly maybe not for parts of uh, my area, there is transport issues for people to be able to get around in parts of Volovian because of buses or lack of buses or wherever housing is built. I think we have to make sure that those who have learning difficulties have the same opportunities that we take for granted in regard to leisure activities, in regard to job opportunities, in regard to volunteering. Um, I do think, as I said at the start, that a lot of progress has been made in the last 20 years. I think there's a, a way to go. But I do think, and I sense, and I hope, that there's a cross-party uh, support for this, and that this isn't a political issue as such, but something that we can work together on uh, to help those in our society who maybe just need a little extra help. Thank you, Deputy Pauline McNeil, followed by Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Joan McAlpine for bringing a very significant issue to the Parliamentary Chamber and apologise to her that I won't be able to stay for the whole debate um, tonight, but I did want to take part. A decent warm home to suit your needs is a human right. To live the best quality of life that you can is also a right. Society must and should give support to all those who need it. Scotland's 120,000 people with learning disabilities must have the type of support that they need to live in a home of their choice and to live the best quality of life that they can, as Joan McAlpine has said. According to Enable Scotland, most people who have a learning disability don't get any form of social care support. Indeed, as Jeremy Balfour has pointed out, it's a very long time since we first took the decision to shift from residential care to living in the community within a supported accommodation. I too remember uh, Glasgow Lennox Castle where children were literally born in that institution and uh, were um, now part of the community now. And it's a very significant policy and it's one that we must finish what we started. People living with learning difficulties are much more likely to live in social housing, 52% compared with 21%. And they're much less likely to own their own homes. In 2017, 698 people were presented as homeless recorded as having a learning disability. There's an upward trend in recent years in the proportion of homeless applicants assessed as having support needs. Indeed, attitudes to people with learning difficulties, I'm told among social workers and landers, is something that needs to be improved upon. Long delays and inappropriate accommodation are just some of the key factors that we need to address in this debate. There are mixed views on whether housing for people with learning disabilities is continuing to progress towards the positive outcomes or whether progress is actually halted. Scottish Commission for Learning Disability and Housing reported in 2017 uh, about some of the key barriers, including the current supply of housing and a lack of accessible accommodation. And I do very much welcome what the Minister said in response to Jeremy Balfour. But they also highlighted a lack of consistency and access to advice about housing options and major challenges towards the funding of housing support which are impacting on the provider's ability to deliver effective person-centred support for people. The Commission also recommended the Scottish Government should develop an implementation framework to prevent people with learning disabilities being accommodated in healthcare settings unnecessarily. 
and to ensure that people with learning disabilities receive the appropriate advice and support to make an informed choice of their housing. Um, in just my last minute or so, I just want to highlight two serious areas that I think require response. Professionals and local authorities are not always sufficiently aware of adaptations that people with sensory impairments and learning disabilities or autism spectrum disorders might require. One respondent said, I am told that I'm not entitled to adaptations to enable to me to live in my own home. If only I were physically disabled, would I be entitled to that? There is an emphasis on online applications, probably for mostly everything that we've discussed in this chamber. And it's one of the areas I think we need to be mindful of people with learning um, disabilities because it is much more difficult for them when they need someone to explain things to them or someone on hand to check or clarify aspects of the process. Advice, adequacy and guidance are very important, at least if not to sustain a housing tenancy uh, and in many cases prevent people from falling into arrears, which of course could lead to eviction. There's a lot of work to do in this parliamentary term to ensure that everyone has a sustainable home appropriate for their own needs. I welcome this debate this evening and I hope in this parliamentary term we can achieve a lot more for the people um, with uh, learning difficulties uh, that need our support in the homes that they want to live in. Thank you. Paul Graham Day to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me begin by congratulating John McAlpin on bringing this debate to the Chamber and for what, from my perspective, was and is her impeccable timing. You see, President Officer, the motion before us dropped into my inbox whilst I was in the throes of dealing with a perplexing situation covered by its subject matter in my own constituency. Indeed, if memory serves, I was just off the phone to my office manager, who had been, uh, frankly, ranting to over the issue in question. So tonight, forgive me for seizing the opportunity to raise what is, from my point of view, a quite intolerable situation impacting a number of my constituents and their families in the southern part of Angus South. A report to the Angus IGB back in May 2016 concerning learning disability accommodation highlighted that there were no local facilities of this nature in either Carnoustie or Monifaith, and that Carnoustie has the highest population of ageing carers for people with a learning disability and or autism. It identified demand for a minimum of four uh, core supported housing units in Carnoustie over the following two years to meet local and indeed wider need. But here we are, two years on, and no progress has been made. This was the third of three accommodation-related priorities identified by the IGB. The first was addressed, the second is being addressed, but this one remains. The reason for that, I'm advised, is that there is currently no revenue funding source available to meet staffing costs for such a development, estimated at north of £450,000 a year. And until this fund, uh, funding can be found, either from the existing IGB budget or from Angus Council, who I think I'm right in saying has the duty to meet this need, no progress will be made with this priority. But here's the rub. A few short months ago, Angus Council were granted an additional £1.565 million by the Scottish Government for the purposes of health and social care and to help reach budgetary settlements with their health and social care partnership. They passed on just £510,000 of that retaining the other £1 million plus. They were able to do that because whilst it was agreed with councils uh, what the money is totalling £66 million across Scotland were for, it was taken on trust. That's where these sums would go. In Angus, that did not happen. And our local health and social care partnership has admitted to me, and I quote, had the so social care partnership been able to agree a more generous recurring budgetary settlement with an Angus council, then this would have assisted overall in its service delivery plan. Put simplistically, had that £1 million made its way to where it should have, then at very least the chances of delivering this housing provision would have been enhanced. Housing provision for people with learning disabilities in Ang South Angus is an issue I've been involved in for some time. A little over two years ago, I approached Angus Council highlighting the Scottish Government's recently announced long-term financial planning assumptions around housing supply and seeking a commitment to deploy an element of this cash to meet the identified learning disability need with a purpose-built facility. 
In responding, the then Chief Executive revealed that a house, housing, health and social care strategic planning group had been established, and through that, the Council would identify which development opportunities should include an element of specialist provision. So in acceptance that rather than adapting existing stock on a house-by-house -house basis, a bespoke unit of the type the South Angus parents of adults and learning disabilities had been campaigning for was on the cards. Yet here we are in 2018 and nothing on the horizon. With Angus Council able, in a build context, to say no can do because there's insufficient funding available to staff such a unit, one might contend because it failed to pass on monies given it by the Scottish Government for this kind of purpose. Presiding officer, is it any wonder Sappold and I, as their constituency MSP, are utterly exasperated by this situation? And that exasperation is all the greater because the Minister for Local Government and Housing announced recently that over the next three years, Angus Council will in total receive in excess of £25 million to support housing supply. So the Scottish Government is passing over additional pots of money to this local authority to meet housing need across the county and to meet health and social care demand. And yet an identified priority for housing and supporting adults with learning disabilities remains unmet. And let me pay tribute to Sapald, both for their campaigning work on this issue and their willingness to try and find solutions. Because they have sought to move things on by sourcing funding to help meet staffing costs themselves. But of course, every potential funder they've approached has come back with the same answer. Sorry, we don't fund statutory services, and so we remain with this impasse. Presiding officer, I question where this sits in terms of disability discrimination and the human rights of those concerned. What's beyond question is that this situation is wholly unacceptable, and I'm deeply grateful to Joan McAlpine for providing an opportunity to highlight it in Parliament. Let me conclude by quoting from her motion, where it references the view that the Scottish Government, local authorities and relevant partners should work together to ensure that every person across the country who has a learning disability can access the appropriate housing and support that's required to give that person the choice and control to live the life that he or she wants. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has provided the means to give my constituents in the South Angus locality that choice and the Minister has tonight indicated additional sums might be available. Those constituents and their families are asking why Angus Council has then failed to meet their needs. Presiding officer. Call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Let me also congratulate Joan McAlpine on securing time for this debate and indeed for the content of her speech. Um, she and I are both core members of the cross-party group on learning disability and I know they're very excited that this subject is being discussed. Um, can I also at the outset welcome the focus brought to this issue by Enable Scotland and their report on where people live and the earlier report last year from the Scottish Commission for Learning Disability on improving outcomes for people with learning disabilities, um, specifically in housing. Now, I think it's undeniable that our surroundings, the community in which we live, our home environment is central to the quality of life that each and every one of us enjoys. The connection between our living conditions and the quality of life is even more vital, I think, for those with a disability. And of course, tonight we focus on those with a learning disability, where clearly more needs to be done to improve provision. There are, of course, a number of misconceptions surrounding how people with learning disabilities live and the level of independence that they have. Many assume that if you have a learning disability, you're likely to live at home with your parents. No hope of a relationship, no hope of a job, no hope of a social life. But what SCLD report tells us is that in reality, 65% of people with a learning disability don't live with a parent or carer. They live themselves or they live with others with a learning disability. 52% of them in social housing, 17% in supported accommodation. In every area of our lives, whether it's what you wear in the morning, what you eat for breakfast, how you spend your spare time, we enjoy the autonomy of tailoring our choices to suit our wants and needs. Those with a learning disability must and deserve to have the same freedom of choice as anyone else. And it's so important that the relevant bodies have the support, have the resources, yes, and the ability to offer a balance between providing first-class sustainable social care whilst offering centrally of central importance the choice of accommodation to those who need it. We cannot have a return to the large hospitals, 
like Lennox Castle, or placements, inappropriate placements in care homes without any clinical need for people to be there. And I welcome that the Scottish um, Consortium on Learning Disability um, report shows a significant reduction in cases of those in institutional care. Although I have to say, I do worry, as others have highlighted in the chamber today, that they find the results to have noticeable variations depending on the local authority is something that is particularly worrying. Now, in some places, there appears to be more shared accommodation that's on a scale that is bordering on institutional, um, and we just don't need this. We know people's preferences are for supported accommodation or core and cluster accommodation, or in many cases, living the, in their own home with good social care support. Now, I very much welcome the Minister's comments about providing additional resource um, for building core and cluster, cluster and supported accommodation. And I will make sure um, that my local government colleagues in Argyll and Butte understand that, because we are dealing uh, just now with cases of um, young men who have been boarded out of the local authority area for whom a return home would be good for them, good for their parents, good for the council budget. I cannot conceive of a circumstance where you would actually reduce the budget to get such a positive result. I'll take an intervention. Gave way. I, I Kevin was, Stewart. I, I, I was actually discussing Argyll and Butte with Cornerstone when I met them uh, in Aberdeen on uh, Monday. Um, and I recognise uh, what Jackie Bailey is saying around about certain local authorities. And I think that she's absolutely right to highlight, um, as is uh, Graham Day, how much is it actually costing at this moment to keep folks in unacceptable situations. Uh, forget in all of that, what is the human cost? So I, I will do all that I possibly can to encourage Argyle and Butte and others to use the finances that are available uh, to look at this uh, very carefully indeed. Jackie Bailey. Thank you, and I am very conscious of time, but I take that um, as a very positive message from the Minister, which he can be sure I will repeat ad nauseum to everybody in Argyll and Butte. And I look forward to working with the Minister to secure that additional funding to actually improve the lives of people with learning disabilities in my area. Um, Presiding Officer, let me finish on, on this point, because I think there has been considerable cross-party consensus today um, on this whole issue. And, and I hope that encourages the Scottish Government, local authorities and relevant bodies to work together because we can improve the standards and types of housing available and we need to do so for those with a learning disability so that we can give them and they can have for themselves the quality of life that they truly deserve. Gillian Martin to be followed by Graeme Simpson. An officer, everyone should expect to have the opportunity to live independently if they wish and to have the same life chances as anyone else. Somewhere to call your own is fundamental to that. Last week I spoke in the government debate on the disability employment gap, uh, which is, whose existence has a huge negative impact on adults with learning disabilities as they strive to gain economic and social fulfilment and independence. And this week, I'm pleased to add more weight to that argument for social and economic independence by congratulating my colleague, Joan McAlpine, on securing this debate on a key component of that independence, the availability of and access to suitable and supported housing. As with many members, I'll be referencing the great work of housing associations in the third sector in securing that independent living for people. And I turn to an organisation who have also referenced in that employment debate for the training and the work opportunities they offer, but who also offered support at living and um, access to tenancies for adults with learning disabilities. And that's Inspire in Inverurie in my constituency. I mention them first because I'll always remember chatting to a young woman who was working in Aspire's soap uh, making initiative. They've got a little shop in Inverurie. And she was telling me that she'd just got the keys to uh, a flat that she'd moved into. But one of the things she mentioned, she's obviously very excited about her new, her new home and her independence that was awaiting her, but she, of particular importance to her was the fact that she was still able to walk uh, just a wee bit up the road to visit her mum whenever she wanted. And the importance she placed on this reinforced an important point about the availability of affordable housing in rural areas. And this point was also made very clearly in the report circulated by Enable Scotland. Independent living shouldn't mean having to move out of your community and away from your family and friendship support network. 
and local supported housing should be readily available in small towns too, like it is in Inverurie with like the, the Ark Housing Association, who also offer supported independent living there. But turning back to the link in the theme from the disability employment debate, I, I made the point then that for parents I know with teenagers um, with autism in particular, coming to the end of their school life, there's considerable worry about what their adult life um, will hold by way of employment. And the stress of balancing the wishes of their maturing young adult to desire the same freedoms of their peers when it comes to living in their own space. Um, and you also have to balance that with concerns with the support available to them. Um, and it must be acute because young adults with learning difficulties do want the same things as everyone else. They want privacy. They want love and sexual relationships. They want to do their own thing. So marrying the two areas of support and independence must be taken into account when the, the geography of the family support comes into account. Um, and all the better if that housing comes with links to employment support programmes uh, or befriender services. Because I take the point that Jeremy Balfour made that loneliness could be a, a, a big factor um, and a big worry for, for parents as their young adults move into supported accommodation. And of course, the Scottish Government are engaged in the biggest programme of building affordable housing in 50 years with a plan for 50,000 affordable houses by the end of this Parliament. And of course, we know there's a commitment for 35,000 of those to be available for social rent. And I welcome the Minister for Local Government's commitment to work with the Scottish Commission for Learning Disabilities to ensure that everything has been done to increase the suitability of uh, that new stock for those with learning disabilities. Um, and the housing sector voluntary grants, I want to mention that, provided by the Scottish Government, will assist the third sector in providing the sort of housing advice and advocacy that takes some of the worry out of this process of accessing suitable accommodation, both for people that are moving into it and for perhaps parents of young adults that are trying to access that. Because at this point, I'm finding myself, as my son prepares to leave home, um, it's not very easy. Um, so it must be even harder for a parent of a young adult who needs additional support to let them go and live an independent life. So that advocacy and advice is going to be invaluable. So just as government commits to closing the disability employment gap, we must work with governments, third sector, housing associations, local authorities and learning disabled people themselves to close the gap in housing that allows independence with support and the life chances and opportunities that come with it, not just in urban environments, but in smaller communities too. The last of the open debate contributions is from Graeme Simpson. Thanks very much. Um, uh, I've got to start by saying how much uh, I've enjoyed the uh, contributions from uh, all, all the other members, uh, and I particularly thank Joe McAlpine for bringing this uh, to, to the chamber. Um, we started off with uh, Jeremy Balfour, we've heard from Jackie Bailey, Gillian Martin just there, and uh, Paulie McNeil, who's, who's not here at the moment, but I was particularly struck by the uh, comments from Graham Day, who uh, spoke with uh, real passion, uh, I thought, about uh, the situation in, in his area. Um, and, you know, I'm often cynical about members' debates, but I, th I think Graeme Day has uh, really shown what we, what we can do uh, with a members' debate. And the fact that it's come from a cross-party group, I think, is uh, very encouraging. I've also been cynical about them, but uh, this one has been uh, obviously doing some, some great work. Uh, so thanks again to Joan McAlpine. Um, it's clear uh, more does need to be done to support independent living for uh, people with learning disabilities. Um, but of course, the housing for them, it's, it's not, u not unique. Um, more needs to be done uh, for people uh, uh, who are homeless. More needs to be done for people with a physical disability uh, or the elderly. Um, we certainly need a great, greater choice, I think, in, in housing in this country. Um, according to the survey from the Learning Disability Statistics Scotland from 2013, there were 26, 000, just over 26,000 adults with a, a learning disability who needed support and 16,000 children uh, who were known to councils. Uh, the recent report on housing and disabled people from the Equality and Human Rights uh, Commission uh, made for some harrowing reading. 17% of councils have a target, just 17%, for funding to adapt housing for people who need it. 
Uh, and over half of councils said they found finding funding for adaptations a challenge. Now, um, I have to say I was heartened by the, uh, the words uh, of, of the minister earlier uh, on, on that. Um, the report called for the setting of targets for accessible housing. I know that the, the minister, um, for good reasons, isn't, isn't, isn't in favour of that. I was also encouraged to hear that he's uh, written to councils recently, um, telling them to up, up their game. Um, and they, cer they certainly need to uh, step, up to, step up to the plate. There's a shortage of suitable housing in Scotland across the board, and people with learning disabilities suffer disproportionately from that. Um, so if we look at uh, what is needed to provide supported living schemes for people with learning disability, uh, we can see why we do need uh, local authorities to, to improve. Uh, supported living schemes include ongoing assessment, hands-on uh, and practical assistance, skills training uh, and general advice and support. I've seen um, in my uh, previous role as a, a, a councillor um, in South Lanarkshire uh, just what can be done um, if, if you work properly uh, with, with the disabled. Um, and I was involved in, uh, in setting up a, a group, really, um, for uh, people to use self-directed support. So I think, uh, you know, I think it's uh, important that we empower people with any sort of disability, uh, learning or, or physical. So just to close, um, I do thank uh, Joe McAlpine uh, once again, uh, and particularly every other member has spoken in this, in this debate, but uh, particularly, again, Graham Day. Thank you. I now call Kevin Stewart to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I'm very grateful uh, to be given the opportunity uh, to respond today on behalf of the government. Um, and I certainly welcome this debate and the contribution, the positive contributions uh, from everybody who has spoken today. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Joan McAlpine uh, for raising this important issue. And I acknowledge her role as Vice Convener of the Cross Party Group on Learning Disabilities. Now, I have to be honest here, um, President Officer, because uh, it's one of those debates uh, where, uh, you know, my speech will have changed dramatically uh, from what it was originally going to be, uh, and I make no apologies for that. But I want to get a number of messages across, um, first of all. Um, this, I want to get across the Scottish Government's clear commitment uh, to improving the lives of people with learning disabilities, which is set out in our Keys to Life strategy and its four strategic outcomes, a healthier life, choice and control, active citizenship and independence. And we understand uh, the importance of housing and achieving these outcomes and the role that appropriate housing can play in realising our vision for people with learning uh, disabilities. Uh, we all know uh, that a, a house uh, is more than bricks and mortar. Uh, it can be safe space, uh, the place which anchors us to our community uh, and gives us ourselves a sense of place. Um, the place uh, where we gather uh, with friends and families and people with learning disabilities have no less right of these things than any one of us here uh, today. Uh, they have the right uh, to participate as full and equal citizens. And that's what we should be striving to achieve right across uh, the country. Uh, we want all disabled people in Scotland to live life to the full in homes that meet their needs. Uh, and a Fairer Scotland for Disabled People uh, launched in December 2016 set out a number of housing related commitments uh, that support this ambition. Uh, and we have delivered supporting housing projects across the country um, for people with learning disabilities. Um, and as Gillian Martin rightly pointed out, they should be in rural areas um, as well uh, as in urban areas. And uh, uh, because Ms McAlpine, presiding officer, is a South of Scotland M MSP, I've listed a number of ones which have taken place in recent years uh, in the South of Scotland. Galashios, Kirkudbury, Annan, um, and, uh, you know, I think that those uh, projects have benefited uh, those communities greatly. But, but, there are many places where we're not yet getting it right. Uh, and Graham Day is right to highlight 
uh, the difficulties uh, that there have been um, in Angus. Um, I would say to all local authorities, in terms of the, follow, uh, the, the formulation uh, of your strategic housing investment plans, when you are making the decisions about what is required in your area, when you're looking at housing needs uh, 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 and demands assessments, uh, when you're following the guidance of the local housing strategy, which we're about to um, refresh, go beyond that. Go beyond that. Use a bit of common sense. Use a bit of gumption. Look at your own casework. Look at your own housing list. Interrogate not only your waiting lists, uh, but those of the housing associations and other organisations uh, that operate in your area. And by using that gumption, by using that common sense, put together a package of housing that is required to meet the needs of folks with uh, learning difficulties and with physical disabilities in your area. Uh, because quite frankly, um, uh, presiding officer, I would imagine that some of the folk that Mr. Day has talked about here today uh, and their current situations it is actually costing Angus C Council more than it would to provide the right facilities for these folks. And I think that every single council has a duty to look at all of this um, as they formulate plans. Because we know that quite often uh, these fixes, as they often are, cost much, much more than actually getting on with a job um, of delivery. And there really is, um, presiding officer, uh, not much excuse at this moment in time. The affordable housing uh, programme itself has put £756 million uh, in the hands of local authorities this year. £1.79 billion pounds over the next three years. That has given them the comfort of knowing exactly what they have got in the bank over the piece. Um, some councils have not managed to spend their re uh, resource planning assumptions, uh, presiding officer, and I'll take in Mr. Simpson. Graeme Simpson. Uh, can I thank Kevin Stewart for taking the intervention? I know um, the, the minister doesn't want to set uh, top-down targets uh, for councils, but does he think they should set their own? Kevin Stewart. Convener, uh, sorry, presiding officer, I, I definitely do think that local authorities should look exactly what the needs and demands are in their area and meet those needs and demands. Um, that's not rocket science um, at all. Uh, and the thing about the housing programme, uh, the affordable housing programme, is that I've said that this is a programme for all of Scotland and for all of Scotland's people. So in order uh, to meet the ambitions of people with disabilities, where they, whether they be learning disabilities or physical disabilities, you know, we have to look and deliver um, for these uh, folks as well. Um, Mr. Simpson mentioned the Equalities and Human Rights Commission uh, and their report on housing for disabled people. And it largely concentrated on folks with physical disabilities. Um, I met with them this morning um, and, uh, you know, I hope um, that we can move forward in terms of dealing uh, with some of the recommendations um, that they have made. Um, but I do think um, that they um, themselves uh, have focused mainly on um, the physical rather um, than learning disabilities. Um, and I do take cognizance of other organisations that have been mentioned by uh, Jackie Bailey and Joan McAlpine and others uh, like Enable and SCLD, uh, they have a positive role uh, to play, uh, to play um, in all of this. But beyond that, one of the things which I always like to do um, is talk to people themselves. I've uh, always uh, had the great pleasure of uh, going to the Aberdeen Stronger Together uh, Learning Disability Group to hear in first hand um, the views of people there, um, which are often somewhat different from the views of folk who are advocating for them at points. Uh, and that is a good thing. 
uh, to hear from folks directly, to hear about their ambitions, to hear what they want to see uh, in terms of housing uh, and other um, areas. Um, but whether it be in housing or in other areas, um, we require continued effort, not only from government, um, not only from stakeholders, uh, including those in the house, housing sector, uh, but we actually need uh, cooperation um, from those folks um, in local government. I have got absolutely no problem um, in interrogating strategic housing investment plans uh, and telling local authorities what I think they're doing well and where they're not. And I think that every single one of us um, has the duty, has the duty as elected members to point out where we think uh, that local authorities are not meeting the expectations uh, of our constituents. Um, I return to the point about listening uh, to folks with learning disabilities themselves. No one knows their needs, their concerns, or their aspirations better than they do. So we all need to listen, uh, including those folks who are maybe not doing quite so well in terms of delivery at this moment in time. Thank you, President Officer. That concludes the debate and the meeting is closed.